Okay, so hi everyone and thank you for joining us today for our HashiCorp webinar. My name is Conan Beechenor, Senior Field Marketing Manager here at HashiCorp, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Nicolas Corello, Regional Director of Solutions Engineering here at HashiCorp, who today is joined by Kapil Aurora, Senior Solutions Engineer, who will be talking to you today about advanced data protection with HashiCorp Vault. Just to make you all aware that this webinar is being recorded, and I'll send the recording to everyone via email after it's been processed, usually within a day or two. We'll be presenting for about 30 minutes today, and then we'll get into a quick demo. We'll then have around 10 to 15 minutes afterwards for questions, so please submit them in the Q&A box provided, and we'll answer them at the end. So with that, let's get started. Over to you, Nicholas. Thank you very much, Connor. So um, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon from those um, joining us in APAC. Uh, if there are people from the US, uh, I hope you have your coffee because it's pretty early there. Uh, as Connor said, my name is Nico. Um, I lead the solution engineering team here in EMEA, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, the new functionality that we released in Vault and more about data protection uh, in general. So um, we've read a little bit of an agenda to get you through. Um, you know, I'm just going to do a very brief introduction to Vault. Um, I want to clarify, um, you know, today we're talking about a slightly um, advanced topic. I am going to do an introduction on Vault, but I'm not going to focus a lot on it. Um, we're going to do, talk about data protection and some of the challenges um, on it in general. Um, we're going to talk about how we can, um, you know, fix some of those challenges or, or, or help you tackle some of those challenges with Vault. Um, and, you know, Capil is going to help us also, um, you know, with some of the talk track, um, a demo, and we're going to talk about a case study. Um, over uh, the course of the um, webinar, uh, please feel free to ask questions using the QA section at Zoom. Some of them will answer as we go, and, you know, some others will just um, pick to answer live. So I would like to kind of um, set the conversation in regards to what, what Vault does and how Vault um, came into play. And I tend to always, funny enough, use the same slide. So if you have seen me talk before, um, you've probably seen this, you know, heard this conversation before. Um, but, you know, Vault came into existence about five years ago when um, we had um, a pretty interesting um, challenge with what I kind of tend to call the, um, the grandfather of what we now know as Terraform Cloud, which way back then was called Atlas. And that is, you know, Atlas was running Terraform pipelines and was deploying infrastructure. And in order to do that, we need to store, you know, cloud credentials, API keys um, from customers. And when we went to the market in regards to how we could potentially solve that um, in a secure manner, we, we realized that the market had kind of two very clear uh, undifferentiated um, product sets. They have kind of a, of a, you know, privilege access management category, which was focused on how do I get this person access to this system? It was very um, driven to a, a human consumer. And uh, even back, even way back then, with organizations starting to kind of bend the functionality of these tools to do more of an application secrets management. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, we had kind of cryptography um, tools. We had cryptography hardware that was focused on how do I um, encrypt or obfuscate or secure um, this information. And we found ourselves into this happy middle white space where there wasn't really a secret management solution that did what we needed, which was not only storing secrets, but also potentially generating, um, you know, handling um, a, a zero touch workflow to consume secrets, to store cryptographic material um, and so on. And that's kind of when Vault um, came into existence, which I don't think initially, you know, it was thought as, as a product, but as we were going through this journey, a lot of people were asking us, how are you storing secrets in Atlas? And we talked to them about um, Vault and they went like, oh, that's fantastic. Can we get it? And we went like, yeah, sure. So talking about Vault um, in particular, it, it it's a very well-known project, a very well-known tool, and a, a widely adopted platform right now for um, secrets management. The idea is you should be able to store your, um, you know, secrets and credentials uh, centrally. That you would have a central um, data encryption platform that you could consume from on-prem or any cloud or any perimeter. 
And um, somewhat recently, we decided to venture into this advanced data uh, protection space and look at use cases that maybe we haven't seen traditionally involved, and maybe we didn't plan initially um, involved. But you know, as as you see on the slide, we have about 300 customers. Um, you know, a lot of them in the financial space. Uh, you know, particularly here in Europe, um, and you know, they were telling us, "Look, you, you definitely solved the problem." Uh, I'm going to have for the next five years, but I, I need to solve this problem that I've been having for five years uh, and, and I haven't been able to, to tackle it. Uh, Vault is very widely used. We, you know, we, we have uh, um, over a million uh, monthly downloads on, on, on the open source. Uh, it's handed, handling trillions of transactions that, and that's the ones we can measure from our customers, right? Um, we, we, we imagine this number is so much bigger um, in open source. And, and the workflow is, is pretty simple. Basically, you know, I'm going to have a client that is going to sort of establish its identity through a particular method in Vault. And based on that identity and subject to policy, it's going to be able to access um, the secret. So let me try to give you an extremely quick overview of, of kind of what are the design principles, um, you know, behind Vault. And as, as I said in the initial slide, you know, there, were, there was a lot focused on humans and, and there was this cryptography, but you know, our target was, we have this application or we have this process running somewhere, it needs to consume secrets, and I don't want to involve a human in the process of this application consuming secrets. So if my primary audience is an application or a process, my primary interface has to be programmatical. Um, in Vault, there is no way to expose any functionality outside of the API, and of course, on top of that, we build uh, a brilliant um, web UI for you know, humans to be able to consume and provision secrets and, and even manage Vault. And we bought, built a CLI, but these, are, these, these two interfaces are just doing calls into the Vault API. They don't have any kind of hidden um, functionality. The next aspect, as you can imagine, was that identity aspect. You know, if I, if I have a human that needs to access uh, a secret, or if I have a process, the first thing I need to know before I give you a secret is, who are you? And if you're a human, you know, we have 50 years of IT history in terms of how to ascertain a human identity. They're going to have uh, an LDAP or Active Directory account or an account in third party system um, that logs in using OIDC uh, or, you know, potentially a GitHub token. They're going to have a sort of multi factor um, authentication method through, um, you know, Duo or, or an RSA token or a YubiKey. Um, they may have a federated identity through Okta. Now, if you are a process, a machine, um, it's, it's kind of a little different. And I, I always tend to remind people that, you know, we used to join machines into AD domains by virtue of an administrator delegating that capacity by logging into the domain to sort of bless that machine to be joined. We wanted to look at that process and we wanted to do something that didn't involve any human interaction. So we kind of have to go back and look into um, what the platform offers us in terms of machine identity. And you know, luckily we find we found a lot of them. Um, we found an AWS as IAM, and you know, GCP has its own AEM system, and Azure has like Azure application groups. Um, you know, Ali Cloud has its own alternatives. Um, of course, if you're um, you know running on Kubernetes, Kubernetes has an identity system, and a pod has um, a JWT with a wrapped uh, namespace and, and service account. Um, you know, Cloud Foundry uses its own identity methods. And ultimately, there are a lot of machine authentication methods that we can use. And, you know, regardless of how you log into Vault, how you establish your identity, you're going to get a short-lived token that identifies you for, you know, follow-up operations. So once I know who you are, I need to kind of define um, what can you do. And we have a traditional policy system, um, you know, that we call ACLs or access control lists in Vault, that, and those policies are associated with tokens. And um, they're pretty basic in the sense that they will look at what kind of secrets um, you can get. But on top of that, we have a governance system uh, called Sentinel that you might be aware of because you might be using it on, on Terraform Enterprise, uh, that looks a little bit less into what kind of secrets you can get and more into under what conditions you can get the secret. Like, you know, you can access the secret path, and this is common for everyone, not particularly this token, if you're coming from this perimeter, or you can access the secret path if you're doing it on a change window, or you can access the secret path if, if you know, um, three people from the cell group allow you to access the secret path. 
Uh, as you can imagine, you know, we won't be relinquishing secrets if we cannot leave an audit trail behind it. So Vault has an audit subsystem that basically, um, you know, logs every request and every reply and hashing or HMACing the sensitive information through your SIEM, through your, um, you know, I don't want to endorse any product, but something like Splunk um, or any other product you use, CloudTrail or anything you may use um, for um, logging. And ultimately, it's a product called Vault, as you can imagine, it's, it stores secrets, okay? So, you know, if in the physical world, we can go write something on a piece of paper and, and put it in a vault, and that's pretty much you can do in Vault, and you can version it as well. But just as we um, wanted to take the human out of that identity process for the consumer, we wanted to take the human out of the secret generation part. So we looked into how to introduce these workflows, and that's what we call dynamic secrets in Vault, for databases where you know I can load a, a SQL grant in Vault and Vault will go and actively create an account for me or a user can throw its existing service principle to access a database into Vault and Vault will handle the password rotation based on um, a policy and a cadence. Uh, we have a number of workflows to manage dynamic secrets. I'm not going to focus on this today. We have um, we, we've done an, we have done our webinars on this. Um, what we're going to focus today is kind of that third rectangle there, or that third square there, which is kind of the cryptography as a service. Um, Vault historically was able to uh, store key material or generate key material inside Vault and provide encryption and decryption functions through the HTTP API or, or just sign and verification. Uh, most recently, we looked at, you know, that, that is very interesting for sort of the new world where you don't have data constraints and so on. Um, but what happens where I actually have to interact with, um, you know, systems of record that have been legacy, or do I have a certain set of constraints or potentially um, ways to help with encryption at rest that, you know, those are things that we haven't looked in the past. And that's kind of what advanced data protection, um, you know, is, is talking about. So let's talk a little bit about um, data protection as um, a whole. You know, uh, the requirements here are, are, are pretty clear. Uh, we need to find a way to uh, store and manage sensitive and valuable data. Uh, there are serious consequences if we don't, um, you know, take care of sensitive and valuable data. And this is not only PII or credit card numbers. This could be things in terms of your own employment record. Uh, the important thing is something that is very common today. Leakage of this data can lead to either uh, hefty losses from a financial perspective or reputation or, or legal um, constraints because, you know, most large organizations are subject to either industry standards, government standards, or super governmental standards. I mean, uh, I'm personally in Europe. I'm extremely happy about uh, GDPR and the protection of my um, personal data. But if you ask, uh, I'm not going to make examples out of anyone, but if you ask about the, the CISO of a particular airline uh, who recently lost a lot of you know personal data, he's probably not so happy about GDPR because he had a lot of he had a lot of challenges to tackle, and he was probably thinking about them. But now there is a price tag in terms of not um, thinking about them. It's the same with every industry. I just took that airline example because it's top of mind for me. Um, but, you know, it's the same in the, in the healthcare industry, it's the same in the um, finance industry. So how can we potentially protect um, our data? Uh, I'm going to give a brief overview and then I'm going to focus on, on kind of three aspects. And, you know, one that is very common and, and is, is sort of the minimal we have been doing is, is encryption at rest. Okay. We have data, that data is stored on disks. You know, we, we're taking the traditional protected perimeter. Uh, approach, particularly in local data centers. So um, guess what? If someone steals a hard drive or if a hard drive goes for, um, you know, for recycling that is not scrapped, uh, we have to make sure that data is not, say, not able to be retrieved um, from that hard drive. And that's literally what encryption at rest looks like. Um, you know, we have encryption in transit. Potentially, I don't have access or management to the um, storage of that data and I need to control that data while it flows through networks that might be you know, more or less trusted, I need to encrypt that information as it flies in order to uh, ensure that it's secure, not only uh, at rest, but while it's flying through processes or applications. 
Um, we have tokenization, which is a very popular concept, which is basically instead of storing that this data, I'm going to indirectly store um, this data by virtue of storing a token that refers me to that data. Um, there are some interesting concepts that you know have been around for a while, but have been traditionally very hard to implement, like format preserving encryption. Um, you know, encryption is fine if I don't have data constraints, but if I'm storing a credit card number on a database field that had a constraint of, you know, a string of 16 um, characters, then I can't just throw any data on it. It has to preserve the format somewhat. If I'm storing a social security number, I'm, I'm potentially storing um, an integer, okay? And you know, I, I cannot refactor my whole system of record in order to um, adopt encryption in transit. So format preserving encryption is an interesting way to do it. Data masking and our option, you know, if some system has to have access, let me give you an example. Um, you know, the web UI needs to um, give information to the consumer that is buying something about what credit card to ask for a CDB. So you can transit that data through a, a mask in order to just keep the last four numbers. And ultimately, this industry has been mostly, and as I said, kind of on my first slide, you know, um, pushed through hardware security models, okay? The, the crypto solutions have traditionally been approved, you know, FIPS approved cryptographic modules that have been mostly hardware, though some cloud platforms have started to offer this functionality as a service with the same level. So let's dive a, a little bit deeper into some of the concepts that I've explained here. So as we said, encryption at rest, you know, very interesting concept. The data in my physical storage device is encrypted. You don't get um, access to it. But ultimately, this data is shown in plain text or stored in plain text, potentially in the file system or in the database agent. agent uh, sorry, in the database agent. So you know this this would be potentially uh, you know subject to a, a SQL dump, for example. Um, but ultimately, you know. Um, encryption at rest is better than no encryption, but it comes with challenges. You know, you need to manage that key material. And traditionally, those keys are stored either in HSM or are self-managed by, you know, a storage platform or a database engine, or they're using some sort of key management solution that is a point solution for that database engine, as an example, or keys are just, you know, stored in the file system. Um, if we move on to um, kind of encryption in transit, as we said, this was a very, very interesting concept where, you know, before persisting um, information in the database, my application can go and transit it through some key material that again is stored on the file system or a key management system or self-managed or, or, or an HSM or what have you before persisting it on the database. In that way, I can control application per application, which application has access to the crypt um, that data. And ultimately, uh, that gives me a greater level of control in terms of what get access to that um, data. And if, you know, my SQL database gets stolen, guess what? They're going to get gibberish. As we said before, you know, this is excellent if you're using a, a NoSQL database or, you know, you don't have any kind of constraints. But if you have a, a constraints, you know, you may actually have a problem because your mainframe will not store a long base 64 string instead of uh, an, an, an integer. Right, so we need to find a way, and, and Nest has been looking into this for quite a while, of how to obfuscate the data in a way where it cannot be easily reversed, but also follows the data constraint. And that's basically what format preserving encryption does. Um, there is an algorithm, um, a Nest algorithm called FFS3-1, which basically provides a functionality of actually, if I, I throw you an integer, it will return me an integer. If I show you, if I throw you a string, it will return me a string. The other aspect, as I said, is, is, is masking, right? If I have a credit card number, I may want to mask the first, you know, um, 12 digits uh, just to show something to an application why, well, you know, some more application may get access to the same number. And again, you know, there are challenges of this because for all this great functionality, there is overhead. You have to manage keys. Um, you know, you have to manage access control and so on. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Kapil, who's going to talk more in depth about these challenges and effectively how we have been working on solving them. All right, thank you very much, Nico, uh, for the great introduction to Walt and also telling us about different uh, ways we can protect data uh, in an organization. Now I will carry on and I will uh, try to walk you through some challenges that we see in this space 
And then we will see how Vault can actually help us and what kind of features does Vault offer in this space. All right, so the first and foremost uh, challenge that we see is of course, uh, we want to see, we see increasing risk, right? We have so many different surfaces for attack with multi-cloud deployments, with low trust networks, uh, right? And then on top of that, if every developer has to reinvent the wheel of cryptography or he has to implement cryptography or learn cryptography, that can also challenge productivity uh, for developers and the whole organization. And if this kind of uh, implementations of security are done by different teams, they are procuring different kinds of infrastructure, and that is also causing more costs for the organization, right? And that is where we have to answer some questions. How can we decrease these costs of in implementing new infrastructure every time? How can we offer these functionalities as central services, as a consistent workflow, which developers can actually just implement using very simple, uh, easy to understand APIs, right? How can we offer this to the whole organization as a central service and also standardize it, right? On top of that, how can we make sure that everything is centrally audited, the, we have more control and we have more transparency in the environment, right? And that's where Vault comes into the picture. Also, I wanted to walk you through some, some of the perspectives, right? So we have different people in the organization who are responsible for security, who have to implement security, starting with the developers. Of course, they want simple APIs, which I already mentioned, right? They want things to be simple. They do not want to invent the wheel again, right, for themselves and learn hard things like cryptography. So these things should be provided to them uh, using APIs. Uh, then if we talk about the security teams, we talk about the security officers, the information security officers, who are responsible for compliance, for making sure that everything is audited, right? They want to lower the risk in the organization. So they have a different perspective when it comes to security and data protection. And of course, they want more control so that they can get uh, all the data that they need at any time, right? And more transparency as to, as to what is happening in the organization and who is implementing and which app new application is coming in and what kind of security protocols it is, it is using. And lastly, the CTO, really wants to make sure that standards are followed, right? Consistent workflows are there in the organization. Uh, his workflows, his workforce is productive, right? And all, all three of these personas and everybody in the organization wants to automate everything, right? So that's very, very important because once you develop something, you want to make it automated so that it just works and there is no human involvement as um, in, in the process, especially in security processes. All right, now, now let's talk about how uh, Vault and its features uh, implement data protection. Um, and we will majorly talk about these four features today. The first one is encryption as service using the transit secret engine that Vault has, where we can use Vault uh, and Vault APIs to actually encrypt data and decrypt the data. Um, then we will talk about how Vault does format preserving encryption how Vault offers data masking, both uh, FBE uh, and data masking with Transform Secret Engine, which is very new, which came out in the latest Vault version 1.4. And lastly, we will also shed some light on how KMIP and HSM integration work in Vault. All right, now let's start with encryption as a service and how can we encrypt data? So this is an encrypt workflow. This means that the application receives uh, sensitive information like SSN number. This, in this particular case, it's a French SSN number, and then it sends it to sends it to Vault, and Vault uh, will encrypt the data and send it back to the application. And this encrypted data can then be saved into the database. Right? It's very very simple, and we will also look at all these functionalities when we look at the demo later. Now, if once we have the data encrypted, right, the application wants to use that data again, right? In that case, it will read it from the database, send it to Vault uh, using the Vault APIs, and then in turn, get back the real uh, social security number. And then it can be used or sent across uh, to another application, for example. All right, so that was Transit Secret Engine. Now, when we talk about how, how we do format preserving encryption. It is very similar, right? It's just that we have a different set of APIs to do that. And in this case, we have 
uh, the same uh, format of uh, of the SSN that we actually uh, uh, the original SSN, and we are also uh, retaining the length. So not only the format but also the length is retained. And this is all done using the FF31 algorithm that Nico already mentioned. Right? So this is again an encoding uh, workflow. In this case, again, the application receives the data and then sends it to Vault to encode it and then saves it into the database. And similarly, when it wants to decode it, it, it will go to the database, fetch the value, send it to Vault, and then receive the real value. All right. And how does masking work? So masking is different from format preserving encryption in the way that the data is masked and it is only a one way, um, one way operation, right? So once you have masked the value, in this particular case, I'm taking an example where an application is probably reading all the data from, from another database and copying it to a new database for a new application. This could be one use case or the use case that Nico mentioned earlier, where we have a web application and it just uses tra uh, transform and vault to just uh, create a mask value for the web UI, right? Even though the data inside the database is encrypted and it's, it's a real value, but the, the application can use masking as functionality from, from vault. This means that not every developer has to create new masking, uh, ways of masking, and it can be standardized within the organization using vault. Lastly, the KMIT feature and the HSM uh, integration that we have with Vault. This is especially for the case when we want to integrate with uh, different storage vendors, which offer encryption functionalities like TDE or uh, full disk encryption and transparent data encryption. And also, for example, VMware and different databases which offer um, uh, uh, encryption functionalities. And they all support KMIP as a protocol, the key management interoperability protocol. And Vault can act as a KMIP or offer itself and present itself as KMIP and multiple KMIP servers. So one Vault instance can be used as multiple KMIP instances. And then in, in the back end, if you want to, uh, uh, if you already have multiple HSM um, available in the environment and you want to use them, you can also integrate Vault with HSM, and especially when you want to maintain your FIPS compliant, and that's the reason HSM was initially brought into the environment. This is a really, really good use case, and that in turn gives everybody else access to the HSM, right? So people who have access to Vault, um, once it is integrated to HSM, makes them compliant uh, with, with the policies and, and um, that, that HSM brings. Uh, some important points. So uh, KMIP uh, is supported as a protocol and all HSMs with PKCS 11 are supported. Um, this means that um, you can integrate any kinds of HSM, not just one or two, which we have validated, which is often the case when you uh, in, have different key management softwares. They are only valid for uh, validated for a certain type of HSM and many times it's the same vendor. So in this case, you can integrate different kinds of HSMs, which is very, very cool and gives you more flexibility. Uh, on top of that, you can have multi-tenancy. So Vault offers namespaces, right? And you can have different organizations within Vault. And these organizations or departments can then have their own KMIP servers, right? So that creates this, uh, um, and enables Vault to be the central service, which can be used by different departments. And all these features, of course, and in turn enable full disk encryption and transparent data encryption, um, which has been traditionally uh, implemented in the organization and also can be integrated into Vault. Um, so this is an image I really, really like because it actually shows the value of Vault where you have different key management uh, Key management, oops, sorry. Key management softwares um, or systems, and you have different keys floating around in the environment. But with Vault, you can consolidate and have one central service and one point, uh, and you can manage all those key management keys from from one place. All right. So let's now go into the demo and uh, see all these features and how they actually uh, are working. Uh, for that, um, 
I have an application which is running in a container. It's a Python web application. And then I have a MySQL database also uh, running as a container on my laptop. And this is the initial setup, right? And we will show you how that is a little insecure. The data is, all the sensitive data is stored in clear text. And then how do we use Wall to actually secure this application, secure also the connection between MySQL and the application uh, with dynamic secrets? And then how Vault actually helps us encrypt the data and also uh, encrypt the data in format preserve, uh, preserving uh, way. All right, so uh, I have written these scripts so that I can go through the demo uh, quickly. And the first script, of course, is just to start the MySQL database. You can see it's pretty simple. I'm just running a Docker container with certain environment variables. Um, and it is going to just start a MySQL server for me on my machine itself. All right, so MySQL is already running um, in the background. And now what I want to do is actually configure my app. Right. So before I run the app application, I'm just going to set the configuration and I, I'm going to show the configuration to you in a minute. So this is the configuration right now. So I have given the name of the database so that it can connect to it and the port. And you can see I'm giving the username password that I just set up in, in the Docker container, which is of course not the right thing to do. I do not want to provide username password of a critical important database within the configuration of my uh, application, which uh, is not very uncommon, uh, I would say, and which happens all the time where uh, developers put credentials within the application configuration. Right? All right, so as a next step, what I'm gonna do is actually show you the application uh, by running it. And we are going to um, go to this application. So this is how it looks. It's very, very simple. The one thing, uh, one tab here shows the application data uh, and the other tab shows the raw database uh, entries. So you can see at this point of time, they're all the same. They look the same. And the SSNs, for example, here, or the credit card numbers are in clear text in both the places, which is of course not what we want. And if I add a new record, it is again gonna add these records in a clear text manner. Now let's see how we can change this and how we can move forward from here. So first thing I'm gonna do is uh, stop my application so that I can reconfigure it and also add Vault configuration to it. And you can see right now Vault is actually not enabled in my application. We'll just wait a few seconds. All right, the application is now stopped. And the next step, uh, so it was just docker stop commands, right? And the next step that we have is to bring Vault into the picture. So what are we gonna do to bring Vault? Vault is, as you know, a very modern application. It is just a simple binary, which can also run as a Docker container. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do here. And I'm gonna start um, doc, uh, Vault in a uh, Docker container as a dev, uh, in a dev environment. You can see I'm starting it in a dev mode. All right, uh, sorry. All right, so Vault is already running and it has started. The next thing I must do is uh, provide a license to Vault. So many features that we are showing today are actually enterprise features. And for that, I'm using the enterprise uh, container here as well. So that's why I want to apply a license to it. And for that also, I have written this small script, which is just a simple command to apply the license. And at the end, I'm also looking at the status of Vault and you can see that Vault is initialized, it is unsealed, and it is ready for our consumption. All right, uh, as easy as it was, now we are going to configure different uh, plugins, different secret engines so that we can make our application more secure. So let's see how we can secure our database. So to secure the connection between the application and the database, we are going to use something called a database secret engine and we are gonna use the MySQL plugin. I'm gonna enable this secret engine at a particular path. I can choose whatever path I want. And then I'm gonna provide it with the MySQL details. You can see username, password, and the MySQL endpoint. And then I'm going to eventually give it the root username password. 
but uh, of course I'm providing it with root password and it will be good to change that root password, right? So what I'm gonna do is as soon as I provide Vault with this access, I'm gonna rotate this password and the password is going to be changed and no human has ever seen this password before. After that, I'm gonna implement a couple of roles which will enable my application, the Python application that I'm gonna use later to get credentials from Vault for this database. And you can see there are these roles are also giving time to live values. And I can also give small time to live values, which makes these credentials really dynamic that I only get a credential for three minutes and then the access is not uh, there anymore. And the application should receive new credentials if you, it wants to access the database. And lastly, we will also test this quickly, how it really works. So let's, let's run this script and see how this all works. All right, so you see that all these commands were successfully run. And at the end, when I'm asking um, Vault for database credentials, I'm getting a username password for my MySQL server. So these credentials can now be used for the next three minutes to access the database, which I think is really, really cool. Although this is not part, uh, essential part of the webinar today, but I thought it was important to show that the dynamic credentials can also be added as part of a, a securing an application. All right, so uh, next step is to set up the transit secret engine. Transit secret engine, as I showed you earlier, is responsible for encryption. And we can enable it uh, with this simple command at a path of our choice. And then we can create keys. So I can create multiple keys to do different uh, encryptions for different values. So if I want to encrypt my uh, SSN with a different encryption key, compared to my credit card number, I can do that, for example. And this is just showing that uh, it is possible to create multiple keys. And then I'm gonna use my secret data as a value and encrypt it for these two, uh, with these two different keys. So let's also run this command. And you can see I, I created two keys and both the keys encrypted the data and they look, of course, different because they, have, they are using different keys. So in this case, I'm just using wall to encrypt my data and also I can use it to decrypt it. Now let's look at how we can use the uh, transform secret engine. It is also very similar, right? I'm gonna enable this transform secret engine and I'm gonna create a role SSN and then say, this is the transformation I'm gonna use for it. And in the transformation, I define the type. This, in this case, it is FPE. So I'm using format preserving encryption and also using a built-in template that we already have within Vault for social security numbers, the US social security numbers, and then associating it with the role that we created. So very, very simple to set up in a couple of API commands or a couple of CLI commands. And then I'm just checking if everything worked. And then at the end, I'm also gonna encode a value and show you that you can also decode it. All right, so let's run this script as well. So you can see that this value, 11122333, this SSN is encoded as 41797389, which is a totally different value and has nothing to do with the original SSN. Uh, now I can decode this value using this command. Um, and it should be able to 41797. Three eight nine seven. So you can see I was able to decode this value and I was able to get it back. So as an application, I'm able to run, uh, run these APIs and get and receive the encrypted and decrypted values. And you can see I got a notification that my MySQL uh, credentials have expired that I just created as well. All right, so moving on, let's also look at the transform secret engine setup for my credit card which is actually going to do masking. In this case, I have to do a little bit more work because I have to define a template, what kind of masking character I'm gonna use, um, how does the pattern for the credit card look, um, and I'm gonna do the same things like creating a transformation, but in this case, I'm creating an extra template, which I didn't have to do because there was an existing template previously. And at the end, we are gonna test it again with a command for this particular credit card number. All right, so let's run it. And you can see everything runs successfully. And my credit card number, which ends with 1111, was masked 
uh, like this in this particular format, which I wished. I could have used stars here, asterisks, or I could have uh, used um, used only the first four digits. So it's up to me what kind of masking I want to do, and I can des describe it in this particular configuration that I made. All right, now we have the database set up, done uh, with database plugin, secret plugin. We have the transform set up done. We have the transit for encryption and we also have masking. So we have all these things set up in Vault and ready to be consumed by the application, right? All right, so uh, now we must up up update the configuration of our application. So I'm gonna show you that I'm, I already prepared it, which is the config.ini after, and I'm gonna just copy it over and and let's also have a look at it. So you can see I don't have my data database credentials anymore because I'm able to fetch it from Vault and I'm providing all these paths that I configured. So the credential database path um, in Vault, the transform data path, if transform should, should be enabled or not, um, the transit data path and uh, the path for SSN and for CCN credit card number uh, masking and format preserving. That's it. So uh, now my application is configured. And of course, the next step is to uh, run the application and see what changed, how everything is working differently. All right, so now you can see in these logs, if uh, we look carefully, we retrieved a username uh, from Vault for my MySQL database. So it's not the root password anymore. And now let's go back to the application and see how, how it is working. All right. so. Of course, the earlier records are, are the same right now. And now I'm gonna create a new record. So I'm gonna create um, my own record and provide fake date of birth. Of course, I am very young. And um, the SSN number, it's of course ends in 007 and uh, Credit card number. Of course, this also ends in 007. And I live in a cool street in Munich. And my salary is very low because my boss's boss is here. He should know, right? So I will just put some very low value here. All right. So this is how the application data looks like. So you can see. Um, I still have a clear text SSN, um, but, uh, right? Uh, but this is the value that the application is able to receive from the database. And this is my real SSN, uh, but my credit card is masked because this is a one-time operation that the application did. And um, uh, I have all these values. Now, look at, now let's look at how the database values look like. So this is very different. You can see, date of birth, which is probably a very sensitive information uh, about identifying um, a couple's identity, uh, this is encrypted and it is completely jumbled uh, and nobody can figure out what it is. And this is not my social security number, right? So this has been format preserved encrypted or format preserving encryption has been used to change this value. And then we have the masked values and other encrypted values about my salary. All right, so that's how we can uh, make an application uh, use all the features from Vault and integrate it within Vault uh, by uh, integrated easily by developers. Let's go back to our presentation. That was it from, from the demo side. Um, we can also very quickly in these environments, right, with, with Docker to our rescue, uh, very quickly destroy everything. So I'm gonna just destroy everything here and it's gone. All right, so let's go back to our presentation. Um, so, and uh, I wanted to quickly take you through a case study as to uh, um, how we helped another customer. So it was a big retail company and which was recently in, in headlines for a massive data breach. And the reason for this data breach was there was a new application in the environment. So they had a new HVAC system and this HVAC system came with the management software, right? So we have a new software in the environment 
and which is installed in it creates some vulnerabilities. It creates um, some uh, exposed network ports, some IPs of, of a very critical database, which of course um, is, is a bad thing. And this new application causes, causes this, these issues, right? And the solution was that they adopted Vault, right? And they used all the great functionalities that Vault provides with encryption, with, uh, with KMIP functionality, and the important thing was that if a new application comes into the environment, it has uh, the access to Vault, it has access to using the crypto functionalities that Vault offers, and it, it, it reduces the time to market or it reduces the time of implementing of new applications which come into the environment and should use cryptography or should use uh, credential management uh, and can then leverage Vault to offer those functionalities to them, right? So as a result, they became more productive, right? So developers can now easily consume these high-level APIs instead of, instead of mastering cryptography themselves or figuring it out themselves, right? Which is very, very important. And uh, this is an important part, this should be an important part of every organization to offer that functionality to, to developers. And at the end, reduce the risk uh, by doing everything centrally and managing all the keys centrally. All right. so. In summary, I would like to uh, say a few things, right? Vault can act or Vault provides you that foundation that you need for cloud security, right? It can act as that central service where every application, every service kind of goes to, to ask for different credentials or different cryptography needs, right? It offers really good advanced data features like encryption as service, format preserving encryption, which is very, very difficult to implement. Right, and data masking as well, so that developers can easily consume it. And for any kinds of traditional applications, any kinds of implementations that you already have, which support KMA protocol, or if you already have HSMs, which you want to integrate, Vault also offers you to add these into this central service so that you can have one major place where you get all auditing information, all, um, all access information, and have more control for, for from the point of view of the security teams and have better transparency. And lastly, you can be more agile, right? As we saw in the case study, um, and you do not have isolated cryptography happening within your environment, which in turn reduces the risks and the costs associated with, um, with implementing these features uh, for any kind of organizations. That's all I had. Um, if there are any questions, uh, Nico and I will be very happy to answer them. So, Kapil, I'm, I'm going to take one that, that was on the chat around, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the format of the, the French SSN number. I, I want to clarify that for the simple demo, we didn't pay much attention into it. But um, when you set up format preserving encryption, you can set up um, a pattern in the template in regards to what numbers get uh, substituted or what um aspects get sub substituted of that element that you are encrypting um, you can also provide um you know per value a tweak um that is uh, included in the ffs3-1 norm much like you do with the salt when you're encrypting something in transit you can provide a tweak when you're using ffs3 so um if you need to preserve certain characters to recognize because you're doing some kind of string evaluation that this is, um, you know, something that you do. Um, that 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 this is a, a, a social security number. You can absolutely um, do that. Um, so uh, I have a couple Hi. more questions. Uh, so uh, Steve was asking around masking. Um, I want to clarify this: that masking is purposely not reversible. Effectively, if you're storing a credit card number, uh, potentially your organization has rules in terms of how to mask that to potentially present it back. Or maybe you're storing uh, a credit card number in an unencrypted way or format preserved in a safe um, place, whereas potentially you have like a user ID which, you, which stores a masked credit card number for all other kind of operations. So the idea about masking is that it is not reversible. It is purposely not reversible. Um, Kapil, I don't want to put you on the spot and I can talk about this, but uh, Pavel was asking us if, if you can show us how it looks on the application, um, you know, in terms of what is actually exposed. Uh, I'm just going to 
make a quick comment while Kapil loads up the code that um, this varies. There are certain libraries that already provide abstraction um, for this. Uh, I know we're working particularly in the case of, of Spring with regards to some abstraction. I know when I'm writing code, I generally write an, abstract, an abstraction for my data processing that already includes transit. So basically, um, when the application reads the data, uh, there is a function already that has, um, you know, uh, unwrapped it. But your mileage may vary on these depending on, you know, kind of how your application is structured and what language are you um, using. Uh, in Python, uh, Kapil, I'm going to give you the, um, you know, give you the floor to show it. Yeah, so in this case, I'm using this uh, library Edgeback, uh, which, uh, which can be used. And in this case, I'm just using the SDK that is provided by Vault and uh, running simple commands to, to encode and decode the data or encrypt and decrypt the data. So you can see Vault, Client, Secrets, Transit, Encrypt Data. Uh, the SDK doesn't support um, uh, transform secret engine yet, so I, in that case, I just made a simple REST call directly to to retrieve my data. So you can just use REST APIs directly if you want, or you can use the SDK uh, that is provided. So both both work, right? For encryption, uh, for uh, masking, as as uh, Nico already mentioned, you cannot demask the value; you can only mask it once. Is there anything else? Um, um, Pavel, thanks for, for asking that. So um, we had a question around um, integration with, uh, you know, past database service like Aurora Redshift. Uh, Andreas, maybe you can clarify if you're talking about uh, sort of the encryption at rest angle or, or the transit and formal preservation and, and, and masking, because these are somewhat different things. I am not aware if Aurora or Redshift support doing key management through KMIP. I don't think they do. But when it comes to uh, transit and format preserving encryption, the transformations are mostly done in the application layer. So, um, you know, regardless of what is your system of record, you know, you, you, can, you can just um, use it. Um, Kana was asking us about, you know, how reliable is, is you know, op the open source version to go into production? The answer is extremely. Um, you have HA, um, you know, available in open source where you can do automatic failover. Um, there are a couple of aspects that I would urge you to look into before going into production with any Vault, commercial or open source. And kind of, I'm posting uh, a link to both an article, and I'll try to post a link to the video to, um, in terms of a presentation I've done in the past uh, in regards to, um, you know, some of the kind of runbook on day zero, day one, day two, um, you know, uh, principles uh, in uh, Vault. Um, give me just a second here. Um, when it comes to, I'm, I'm going to look for the video later. So kind of that, that hopefully gives you a little bit of an overview. Uh, James, when it comes to best practices, um, I would urge you to kind of go through that um, document, but you know, some kind of uh, quick and easy things uh, to take into consideration when it comes to like the number of um, uh, nodes you know, the, the kind of default uh, setup of Vault is you have three node, um, three Vault nodes, uh, either or five uh, Vault nodes using the integrated storage backend, or you have three Vault nodes and five console nodes um, backing it. Uh, in regards to scaling, I've done some performance tests in the past, but your mileage will really, really vary in regards to what are you consuming of Vault. Uh, for example, if you're using Transit, uh, I've done some tests where I'm, I'm pushing, you know, um, two, three, four thousand um, transactions per second on an M4 large in AWS, and you can kind of scale that horizontally in the commercial version because you have those performance standbys. But if you're using other use cases, I, I guess we would have to look into it um, further. And what I I can gladly offer you is we're also offering what we're calling um, office hours, where you can have some one-on-one -on -one time with uh, an engineer. And you know, if for those kind of in-depth questions, um, what I'm uh, going to do is post the Calendly uh, link for the virtual office hours. And if you want to sign up um, for that, um, you know, please, um, um, you know, feel free 
and you'll either get me or Kapil or anyone else from the team in Europe or, or a lot of our US um, colleagues too. Uh, in regards to the next kind of technical lab and demo, we are running a number of like, you know, uh, workshops and, and webinars. Um, the agenda is available and Connor, um, I don't know if you want to comment on some of the upcoming events or potentially where people can get access to uh, those. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think a, a great one would be HashiConf Digital. You know, it's, uh, it's taking place on the 22nd to the 24th of June. Um, and it will be a virtual event and really a great opportunity to hear the latest product updates. We've got some keynotes, but we've got workshops as well uh, and technical sessions that you can do from the comfort of your own home. Um, so you can register for free at hashiconf.com forward slash digital. And I'll include a link in the follow up email for everyone as well. Um, so with that, it looks like we are done with the questions as well. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this webinar was recorded and we will make the recording available on our website after it's been processed. And that usually takes a day or two. I'll also send an email to everyone who did register with that recording link. Also, if you liked what you heard today and you want to start exploring Vault in more depth, I encourage you to check out our new Learn site. Now you can find that at learn.hashicorp.com forward slash vault. So with that, I hope everyone should enjoy today's webinar. And thanks again to Nicholas and Kapil for our uh, great presentation and demo and to everyone that took the time out to join us today. We look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.